what a God of love can do. Please be seated. Trinitas Church, uh, the summer has arrived. If you are a native Northwesterner, this is uh, when the hiking trails uh, become readily traveled. And, um, you know, I've always been a hiker in this area, and I've always loved a good mountain pass where you crest some ridge and you're able to peer over the other side and see some vista that you've never seen before, perhaps. Today in this passage, we're going to read about a mountain pass, but it's going to be a thorny pass, and it is going to be at the heart of a strategic effort to win a battle. We are still in the same battle that we found ourselves in last week. We're going to be in it for a couple of Sundays. It's called the the Battle of Michmash. It is an occasion in which the Philistines have captured the heart of Israel. They've been occupying the land for a period of time. And we're going to see the power of one individual to wage warfare. This has everything to do with ourselves. We are in the midst of a culture that is increasingly non-Christian. And we have a battle to fight. Albeit not with swords, but with the sword of the spirit. With this in mind that we are a people in the midst of battle that we have a task not unlike that of the warriors about which we are going to read. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer first and ask our God, our commander to give us insight from this passage. We're going to ask the king who is always warring for the ends of his kingdom to enlist us the more in that army. So please bow your heads with me. Mighty God, we have degraded your worship into an occasion perhaps to hear inspiring and too often trite truths. Lord, we have treated your worship as something inessential to our lives as Christians. Nearly every one of us has had some season where we cared very little for the task that you have set in front of us. Lord, because we are part of a people of unclean lips and we cannot live in the midst of of an American people without imbibing some of the same disposition. We need your help today. We need to have granted to us by your Holy Spirit some sense of the urgency of battle before us and the responsibility that each of us has. Most of all, we need to be comforted in the fact that our King Jesus is already victor over Satan, sin, and death. Lord, we need this peace that we might go out and battle under his banner. In Jesus' mighty name we pray by your spirit, amen. If you'll turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 14, we're gonna read the first 23 verses of that chapter. When I'm done reading, I'm gonna say that this is God's word and you can respond, thanks be to God. And we'll sing a short verse together, the glory of Patri. 1 Samuel 14. Now the day came that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who was carrying his armor, come and let us cross over to the Philistines garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah under the pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And the people who were with him were about 600 men. And Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, The son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the priest of the Lord at Shiloh was wearing an ephod. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to cross over to the Philistines garrison, there was a sharp crag on the one side and a sharp crag on the other side. And the name of the one was Bozes and the name of the other was Sene. The one crag rose, uh, rose on the north opposite Michmash and the other on the south opposite Geba. Then Jonathan said to the young man who was carrying his armor, come and let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Perhaps the Lord will work for us for the Lord is not restrained to save by many or by few. His armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Turn yourself and hear, I am with you according to your desire. Then Jonathan said, behold, we will cross over to the men and reveal ourselves to them. 
If they say to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand in our place and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, then we will go up. For the Lord has given them into our hands. and This shall be the sign to us. When both of them revealed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines, the Philistines said, behold, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden themselves. So the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will tell you something. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come up after me for the Lord has given them into the hands of Israel. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet with his armor bearer behind him and they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer put some to death after him. That first slaughter, which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within about half a furrow in an acre of land. And there was trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. Even the garrison and the raiders trembled, and the earth quaked so that it became a great trembling. As Saul's watchman in Gibeah, a Benjamin looked, and behold, the multitude melted away, and they went here and there. Saul said to the people who were with him, Number now and see who has gone from us. And they had numbered. And when they had numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. Then Saul said to Ahijah, bring the ark of God here. For the ark of God was at that time with the sons of Israel. While Saul talked to the priest, the commotion in the camp of the Philistines continued and increased. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and came to the battle. And behold, every man's sword was against his fellow and there was very great confusion. Now the Hebrews who were with the Philistines previously, who went up with them all around in the camp, even they also turned to be with the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. When all the men of Israel who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines had fled, Even they also pursued them closely in the battle. So the Lord delivered Israel that day and the battle spread beyond Beth-Avon. This is God's word. Trinitas Church, I'm going to run through the basic events. So you've got a clear idea in your mind what is taking place. And then I'll have five lessons for you about the battle before us. The basic events began in chapter 13. In the chapter before the one we just read, King Saul's son, Jonathan, surprise attacked um, the, the Philistine forces in Geba. What we're about to read is something similar, another surprise attack where we actually get the details. But in this previous surprise attack, the Philistines all mobilized at Michmash with 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen. This is an absurd number of fighting men in the ancient world. King Saul had consolidated his army in a place called Gilgal. It was a fortress place, a safe place, but his army was reduced to 600 men. King Saul advances those 600 men to Geba, which is not far from Michmash, but the two cities are divided by a ridge of mountains. And In this particular position, both sets of forces are relatively secure, relatively safe. Saul has now amassed to himself a man named Ahijah. He is a descendant of the former priestly family of Eli, which got wiped out at the beginning of this book. Seems like maybe he learned his lesson that he shouldn't be offering sacrifices himself. That got him into a lot of trouble in the last chapter. So now he's got a priest at his side and he's sitting under a pomegranate tree. Often, you will find Abraham and other people in the Bible having their forces in some area where there are wooded um, woods and trees to uh, prevent them from being subject to the elements, the sun in particular. But what happens now in chapter 14 is that Jonathan, the son of Saul, by divine inspiration, decides to attack this massive Philistine garrison almost alone. Just him and his armor bearer. The way he's going to do this is by surprise attack, passing through the mountains where no one would expect you to go. In fact, at the top of this mountain ridge, 
there is actually between, if you think about the top of a mountain ridge, there is a, a chasm in the very center of it. In the center of this ridge, and on both sides, there are steep cliffs, so steep and so notable that they have names. On the north side, the cliff is called Bozes. This word is harder for translators to identify as to what it means. It can't, could mean perhaps miry. But the other cliff on the south side, it called Sene, well, it literally means thorn bush or bramble. That's a berry bush, blackberries, you can imagine. What you have there for is a chasm at the top of a ridge with thorny bushes all around inside. It's not hard to decipher why no one wanted to pass through this region, why both sides thought themselves safe on account of it. Well, what Jonathan seems to have had revealed to him from the Lord is this. God will give him a sign. If he passes over this pass, goes down through the crags and the canyon in the center and all the berry bushes and all the stickers and comes up on the other side. And the Philistines say, hey, who are you? Reveal yourself. Come here. He is to know that the words being spoken are from the Lord. Come here, come fight, come battle and respond. Do just that. If on the other hand, they say, hey, you stay down there. We're going to come out and check things out. Then they're supposed to hold their ground on the other side of this cliff. Of course, what happens is they call them forth. They go forth and they begin a slaughter. They kill 20 men at the top of the ridge. What this eventually does is it throws the entire Philistine force into confusion. They begin to slaughter one another. And even Israelite defectors to the Philistines, they turn coat, they join the Israelites, and there is an incredible victory that day. Verse 23 says it. So the Lord delivered Israel on that day. Friends, I'm going to tell you something. It's a passing note. One of the wonderful things about being Christians and having devotion to this religion so rooted in history is that we can actually identify where all of this occurred. We know exactly where Michmash is today. We know exactly what ridge and what valley, or rather what canyon in the center of that ridge we're talking about. And in fact, in World War II, excuse me, World War I, British forces were fighting the Ottoman Turks in Palestine. And the Ottoman Turks were in Michmash. And the British forces were in Giba. And no joke, Field Marshal Edmund Allenby of the British Army, one of his brigade majors took a small contingency of men exactly down the same route that Jonathan and his armor bearer did, where they took the city of Michmash in modern warfare. The religion to which we belong is a historical religion, friends. This is an entirely believable story because frankly, it has happened since then. So we turn to our lessons from this passage. The first is with respect to the power of one individual. One man's boldness leads to national victory. And every single Christian in this room must aspire to give a bold unashamed, uncomfortable witness to Jesus Christ. With the word of God as your sword, wielded by the Holy Spirit with a belief that God is not restricted to victories with a massive force. He can do mighty things with but a few. You need to believe this. It's incredible how one bold witness to Jesus Christ has the power to inspire masses. To, to really ingest this point, we have to have this idea that we are not on this earth to prosecute personal offenses. We are not on this earth to take pride in ourselves and smack down anyone who tramples on our pride. 
I say this, friends, because honestly, most of us are more prepared to go to war for our pride. Most of us are more prepared to lose composure in a group of people and get a bad reputation to fight for ourselves than we are to speak boldly about Jesus Christ, the Savior, the one and only individual who can redeem the world. I would simply ask you, are you more willing to say things that paint you with a particular color when you feel like you've gotten bad service at a restaurant? When you feel like someone hasn't called you on the telephone enough and you're gonna give them a piece of your mind? Are you more bold to prosecute for yourself than you are willing to speak the name of Jesus Christ and maybe have people hate you for it? You're all gonna find yourselves in many hostile places in the world in which we currently live. Our land is occupied by evil institutions that frankly hate, hate the Christian faith. You will find yourself in vocations where the policies themselves and the people who work there are contrary to your worldview. If you get any type of education at all, any higher education at all, you will find yourself in places where people are hotly opposed to all that Christianity stands for. If you even simply like to recreate by way of private sports clubs, book clubs, hiking clubs, you will find yourself amidst unbelievers. And I'd ask you this, have you ever felt the solace in one of these hostile environments of one person in that room boldly confessing Christ as Lord and and coming out, I'm a Christian. Have you ever experienced the comfort and solace of going, ah, my people, my people. There is something mighty about being unashamed of Jesus Christ, simply revealing yourself. You look at what Jonathan did, half the battle was going to the other side of this nasty thorny pass and saying, hey, I'm here, I'm here. I am part of the enemy forces in the land that you are occupying, it's me. Christians, this is a basic act of faithfulness to which we are all called And there is a cascading effect in a place where Christians simply announce themselves. I recall at Northwest University um, when I had first met Heather and we'd only been dating for a brief period, uh, one of the classes, um, they were just expounding a really anti-biblical view of women in ministry, that women could occupy any role in the ministry whatsoever. And the particular university that we were at, that was a very popular conception. And it would have been easy to say nothing. And I imagine this professor often teaches this idea and just moves right along. But my wife raised her hand and said, "Mm, I don't think that's biblical. As a result of that one raised hand, it was swiftly revealed that countless people in the class felt the same way and didn't just feel that way, but knew the Bible verses that said those things. Got to hand it to the Ukrainians. A lot of Ukrainians at the university we were at, all those girls came out in force. They were ready to agree in some of the most outspoken opposition to this anti-biblical idea came from the women in the room. Friends, it's hard to speak true things when you know they're not popular. This doesn't just go for you and your workplaces. This is true of a presbyter like myself when I go to deliberative bodies like presbytery or general assembly, and I've seen it a hundred times. Maybe people are just tired and a really bad idea gets set forth. And had it not been for one person to say, no, 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 that's off the mark. Maybe bad resolutions get passed, bad judgments get made. It is hard to speak true things when you can tell that people would rather just carry on without opposition. They would rather be like Saul sitting under the pomegranate tree with a comforting ridge between them and the enemy. But we've got to reveal ourselves. To do this, friends, effectively and honestly, you have got to be prepared to lose. I think we make the mistake that when the Lord said to Jonathan that he would deliver the enemy into their hands, our hands, plural, 
There was some sort of personal guarantee to Jonathan that you wouldn't die, which is not at all the case. Jonathan belonged to a nation called Israel. Could very well be that their surprise attack would initiate a victory for us, our nation, our people at the expense of his life. And God would not have been dishonest. Countless men have done just this in the scriptures. Samson in the Philistine temple delivers Israel by his death. Josiah, one of the most godly kings, dies in battle against the forces of Egypt, weakening them so that they can be overtaken by Babylon. And of course, Jesus Christ and every Christian martyr has victory in their death. Not only was this man totally capable of dying and having God's promises be true to him, but even in life, he would experience incredible discomfort along the way. You ever rock climbed down jagged cliffs with armor? Have you ever had to pass through thorny bushes, maybe bloodied on the other side? Perhaps part of the fear that Jonathan and his armor bearer struck into the hearts of the enemy is that these two crazy men were climbing out of a pit, perhaps bloodied, leaving the Philistines wondering who in the world these people are or how many of them there might be or what links they might go to for this battle. I'll tell you the same thing is true about your witness for Christ. It is often the case that the more you have to lose, the more discomfort you stand to experience, the more your bold witness will strike a godly fear into the witnesses of it. We are not called to carry on in some comfortable place, Christians. We're called to pass through thorny passes. I simply ask how many of you have engaged in a reckoning with the cost of discipleship. I promise you with the fullest assurance that this promise will be fulfilled, Jesus will ask you to testify to him in the face of loss. He will do it. He couldn't have been more outspoken about it. He will ask you to reveal yourself, present yourself, to enemies who are hostile. Jesus says, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my father who is in heaven, but whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my father who is in heaven. He is plain. Does this mean that if you ever deny Jesus even one time? No, it's talking about a lifetime, a lifestyle of denial versus confession. Peter obviously got scared and denied but he has countless other instances of bold confession. The apostle Paul can put it this way at the very beginning of his letter to the Romans, right, right in the epicenter of worldly power. He writes to this church in Rome, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But I ask you, are you prepared to lose? Are you prepared for discomfort? Peter again said to Jesus on one occasion, behold, we have left everything and followed you. We've lost everything to follow you. Revelation 13, 17 is clear. Every civil government that sets itself up against Christ as Lord will also be hostile to his people. They'll become like beasts. And the beast, therefore, is described as saying, he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except for the one who has the mark, the one who belongs to him. I just, I often think we, we think that Jesus was speaking in cute terms, mere metaphors, when he says things like, take up your cross and follow me. No sense that there is a real laying down of our lives for the ends of the kingdom. And we have, to, we have to be reckoning with it. This life is more like a thorny pass, friends. And what we're doing in church every Lord's Day, hopefully is reckoning with the weight and the glory of being a living sacrifice. 
If it was hard to get up this morning and go to church, harder still will it be to be a witness for Jesus Christ in hostile places. And the good news is this, Jesus our Lord is not the sort of king who simply sends men into battle to go and die on his behalf. Quite the contrary, he leads the way and there is a reason why our Lord wore a crown of thorns when he was crucified. It is to show us that he has borne the weight of this thorny pass. It is to show us that he He has passed through every discomfort to save us by his atoning blood. That's the power of one right there. We will never suffer as he did. We'll never die as he did. But we must follow. The second lesson that we can take in today is that the power of two, the power of two is something special and there is a special calling special calling to be able to recognize a warrior and to come alongside of him as an armor bearer. Every one of us will do this in different ways and different degrees in our Christian life. You think about Jonathan. Would Jonathan have undergone this surprise attack if there hadn't been just one individual at least, his armor bearer to whom he could present this idea and actually have him look back with him with a straight face and say, I'm right behind you, let's go. Would he have? Friends, it's a confirmation of calling toward any task in ministry and honestly, any vocation in life that others recognize that calling. This is a theme all throughout the Bible. And frankly, every bold leader needs to be reminded of his calling. What is true of a climbing expedition through a canyon, you might want to have a partner when you do something like that, is also true of the Christian life. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 10, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls... The one will lift up his companion, but woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. You will find pairs and pairs and pairs throughout the Bible. Moses and Aaron, the 12 disciples are sent out two by two. The 70 disciples, two by two. And even Jesus Christ himself had a disciple called the beloved disciple, his nearest and dearest. And that beloved disciple, the apostle John, though he did not spokenly confess Christ, he came the closest to the cross of all the 12. It's an indispensable task for every Christian. No one in the Christian faith just gets to be a warrior and everybody else is armor bearer. This Jonathan will go on to be more like an armor bearer to David, more like to, more like into a faithful companion to a superior. Even though in this text, he's the warrior. Remember when Young Life came to Lake Stevens High School my sophomore year, the Young Life leader, uh, he knew the, the vice principal and the vice principal knew I was a Christian and knew I was relatively outspoken. And this guy met me and um, told me he wanted to start Young Life. And uh, from that day forth, to his every, to his every plan and vision, <laughs> I was his companion. When he said jump, it was how high? Simple. I could see this man wanted to do something in a public high school that needed to be done. Have the gospel clearly set forth. His name was Alan Davis. Love this guy. About 15 years ago, my cousin-in-law planted a church up uh, northward from here. His name's Sam Ford. My wife and I joined that church from the very beginning. And again, if he wanted to have small groups set up, tear down, he wanted to have an event. It was simple. My task was to say, what can I do? Friends, even to this day as a Presbyterian, this is what I love about being a Presbyterian. There are men who are way more qualified for certain tasks than me. I was on a court of the church last summer where we were adjudicating issues between congregants in their session. It was so nice to look to one of the ruling elders on that court with me, who is also a lawyer and um, a state senator. This guy was the man. He knew how to handle everything, knew all the procedures, and I was glad to be his companion and armor bearer. 
I've also been glad to be the beneficiary of armor bears. For 20 years ago, when Scott Hedgecock and I were both attending a mega church, I distinctly remember Scott saying, you could be a pastor. You could be a preacher. I'll be quite frank, friends. I don't know that I would ever have taken up such a task were it not for a friend who not only said that, but came alongside of me uh, for a year, met with me to pray and to plan and to have strategy for what it would be like to have a church plant. I just don't know if I would ever do something like this. Every one of you needs to have a sense that it is indispensable for you to look around and say, who is God? right now, calling to do a work and a labor, and how can I come alongside? Frankly, uh, women, every wife has this task with her husband. To support and encourage a man, to know his strengths, reflect those things back to him, speak those to him, his gifts and his abilities, and most of all, to point him to his real spiritual armor, the word of God, prayer, sacraments the virtues of faith and fortitude and endurance and hope. And the fact is, wives, you will see the greatest conquest in your marriage relationships and victories, you yourself and your husband, when you have that sense of task. On the other side of this, Jonathan's not the only man with victory. It says then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet and with his armor bearer behind him, and they fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer put some to death after him. The first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men, within about half a furrow of an acre of land, like half of a field as cultivated. In relation to Christ, we are all armor bearers. We are all at his side, with him advancing forward as the mighty conquering king. Third thing you need to consider today is this. There are true Christian soldiers in every compromised organization. This story is about how a really dysfunctional family with Saul at the head of it, nevertheless has a son in the midst of it who is a true gem. In dysfunctional families, corrupt governments, and unfaithful churches, there are almost always some saints. Saul, we have seen, is impatient, disobedient. He usurped the priest's role in the last chapter, and he does something similar here. When he sees Jonathan is actually causing a commotion in the other camp, he says to Ahijah, bring the ark of God here. Would have been a brilliant thing to do. Acknowledge God in the midst of this. But it says, while Saul was talking to the priest, the commotion in the camp of the Philistines continued and increased. And so Saul said to the priest, ah, withdraw your hand, forget it. We're already winning. (laughs) This is Saul for you. He's quickly becoming a man whose best ideas are um, something that his own impatience gets the best of. If you'd seen this family, you would say what they said about Jesus. Can anything good come from the house of Saul? As they said of Jesus, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Something good did come out of this house. This needs to give us pause, friends. When we think about other Christian organizations that we know to be deeply compromised, we must have it behind, or excuse me, before our minds that there are almost always real brothers and sisters in those organizations. At the 50th anniversary of the PCA, you know what we did? We decided to resend a letter that we had written in 1973 to the mainline Presbyterian denominations telling us, rather telling them, our concern about how they've gone off the rails. The larger Presbyterian denomination, the PCUSA, we can say, That is a compromised church to the core. But we must stop short of saying that there are no Christians in it. Did you know that possibly the most scholarly warrior and defender of biblical sexuality in the world today is a member of the PCUSA? His name's Robert Gagnon. This guy is a warrior. And he won't leave. 
He's purposefully staying in a denomination who is hostile to his witness and he will not leave until they kick him out. We must be aware that we have brothers in places that we might never expect. That's what Saul was, or excuse me, Jonathan was in Saul's house. This leads us to a fourth lesson. Among those whom you regard to be outright enemies of Christ. We're not just talking about compromised families and churches, but out and out enemies. There are countless people elected to be soldiers for Jesus Christ. We see this in the passage before us. Once Saul sees that there is a victory coming about through his son, not only Saul begins to react, but in fact, Hebrews within the Philistine army itself. It says in verse 21, now the Hebrews who were with the Philistines previously, who went up with them all around in the camp, even they also turned to be with the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. And when all the men of Israel who had hid themselves in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines had fled, even they also pursued them closely in battle. Here's what happened, friends. When Israel was being occupied by this unbelieving and godly force, many Israelites said this, if you can't beat them, join them. Forget it. They're called Hebrews in this passage. That was a name that probably would have been preferred by Israel's enemies, not even regarding them as a nation, but just a Hebrew clan. Others went into hiding. We read they went and they hid. But when they see God's people going forth in battle, they are inspired to defect. And you need to remind yourselves, you need to remind others of this truth. When you see people out marching in the street for ungodly causes, wicked sexuality, when you see people marching for causes of great confusion, you need to look on that people, not only with spite and disdain, but you need to look on that people with hope in the reality that some of those people who are marching, first of all, never believed these ideas in the first place. They rather looked at a culture and they said, I can't beat them. I'm just gonna walk with them. But in their heart of hearts, they never believed it at all. You need to know that every time you see such a march. You also need to know there's another type of people who maybe at the beginning of that corrupt cause did believe it. But as that cause gets more and more confused and goes into a realm that is more and more insane, they will, by God's grace, wake up to the evil and confusion involved in it. You need to know your brothers and sisters, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but someday, they're marching in those forces right now. You need to believe it, you need to know it, and you need to pray that our God would rescue them from it. But the fifth and final lesson is this. Satan's kingdom has been defeated by Christ. And beneath its pride is the deepest insecurity, suspicion, and hostility to its own members. You need to know that every ungodly cause in this world hates its own members more than it hates Christians or the Christian faith. This is a fact. You might ask the question, how is it that these two men reduced the Philistine army to self-destruction? It is because there were already cracks in that force as it was. The picture is something like this. Jonathan and the armor bearer come up from the other side of the canyon And they begin to subdue a small contingent whose job it was to be at the top of the hill. They begin running back toward their people and their people are looking up saying, why do we have our own garrison running toward us? Have they defected? Are they against us? Then when they see that some have died, each man begins to suspect his neighbor. In fact, we've already read, there were some Hebrews who were part of their force and they might be thinking, There's an uprising in our own midst. Then suppose you see your fellow soldier kill another soldier whom you loved, whom you knew and cared about. Now you assume he's your enemy and you go at him. And all of a sudden, the entire camp is in disarray. 
When you add to that natural human hatred for other people, the fact that often in workplaces and in any line of work, you look at some people with covetousness and envy and say, I never really liked that guy. I always knew he was a bad apple. It's not at all hard to see how we have a force collapse upon itself. On that day, it says all the people who were with Saul rallied to him in, and came to him in the battle. And behold, every man, that's of the opposing forces, every man's sword was against his fellow and there was great confusion. Friends, I will tell you something, you err deeply. If you look at the forces of secularism today and you find yourself sighing as if you were already defeated, they were invincible, there is no capacity to resist. Friends, that force isn't even a unified force. Because deep, deep in the conscience of an unbelieving world, there is this knowledge that one man, Jesus, has defeated Satan on the cross and he is purchasing for God and elect people and Satan cannot keep them with his worldly lies because Jesus will give them eyes to see and he has already done this in such great proportions that unbelieving societies have to look at their people with the greatest suspicion and fear that maybe they might be going soft. Maybe, maybe their heart might already be getting captured by their enemy, Jesus Christ. This is what we see in today's modern culture wars where feminism was once the avant-garde of what it means to be progressive, Feminism is being eaten up by the more progressive progressive. Where science used to be king, even now science. Science potentially produces hate facts. Classical liberalism and free speech was the beginning of the uprising. Now we need to suppress free speech. People who found themselves believing in the basic ideals of progressivism are finding it very obvious You can never be sufficiently progressive. They are eating their own. Same is true, friends, with people on the right. Politically, there are those who are given to conspiracy theories, and it's a dangerous thing when you start going down that road because you will find people who don't quite believe the conspiracy to the degree that you do, in which case you're a little bit afraid of them. Maybe they're a part of the machine. Friends, we must not fall into these grave dangerous errors. We must recognize they are the seeds of destruction in a kingdom being defeated by Jesus Christ. I will tell you, there is something to be said for this fact. If you think that coming out as an unbeliever wins you spite from the Christian church or from a conservative community that has always followed Jesus Christ, try coming out as a Christian on a university campus. Friends, the reaction is visceral because they are afraid of a faith that is powerful. Have you come to believe that it isn't powerful? If you're with us today and you've never believed in Jesus Christ, we have an interesting proposition to you. Our ask is that you join us in a march up a thorny pass that will sometimes leave you as a lone warrior, maybe with one companion, Our ask is that you follow the one who wore a crown of thorns and exit that society which eats its own and come into the arms of the Savior. Who's starting with you and your sin is placing every enemy under his feet. But if you believed in him, is raising you up to eternal life. That's the gospel, the good news we have for you. Receive Jesus Christ, we pray. Bow your heads with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you that you went forward. You went forward. When everyone had abandoned you, you wore a crown of thorns. You bore the hatred and the hostility of the world, the full assaults of the enemy, the devil. Most of all, you bore the wrath of God, the father, that none of us would have to who believed in your name. 
Living Jesus, give us some fight, we pray. Clad us in your armor. Give us a disposition where we have a sense of responsibility to carry one another's armor, to remind one another of their strengths, to come alongside. Remind us that we need the same. We need companions. And God, we pray for a mighty victory in this land. Living Jesus, we pray that your elect, you would call them out of societies of people who are confused and self-destructive and give them a mighty and bold witness that even more might be saved. In Jesus' name we pray by your Holy Spirit, amen.